Um, this morning, in my last teaching, I want to give some biblical wisdom on marriage relationships, and I believe what I'm going to share today applies to singles, widows, um, any any strife in between that we have. And I, I don't think it's just about marriage, but there's some powerful truths here. And all of this is going to be relational stuff in your marriage. So that's what I want to talk about. A lot of it has come out of this counseling session, when I, what I see in, in marriages that get into trouble relationally and what's going on. So I want to address five quick areas here in this. So I'd like for you to go with me to the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to the one that knows it all, Jesus. <laughs> um, and let's go to the Sermon on the Mount. I want to look at one verse here that can heal your marriage. It's such a powerful statement. And I think we dismiss it, but if we really meditate on it, it's a very, very powerful statement. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. This is commonly known as the golden rule. That was not, it was not known that way back when it was stated in early, early church history. That statement, the golden rule, came up in the, about the 18th century. Somebody came up with the golden rule. Somebody once said that the golden rule is whoever, whoever owns all the gold rules. <laughs> but that's not what this is about. Okay. But let's read it. It's so simple, and yet one of the most profound verses in the whole Bible. So therefore... Jesus says, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. <clears throat> um, so I want to give you the context here because this verse starts out with a therefore. He's drawing a conclusion from what he just finished talking about. And what is he saying in these verses just before? He's talking about prayer. And he's saying, look, if a son would like to get bread, the father's not going to give him a stone. If the son asks his father for a fish, he's not going to give him a snake, king cobra. Here, you can have this king cobra. No, he says, and the truth is, we are evil people, and God gives us good gifts. That, that is an amazing thing about God and His grace and mercy. You and I, we fall short. You and I, we're not as spiritual or maybe as righteous as we think we are. And yet, despite all of that, God pours out good gifts on us. And He blesses us. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was complaining. I was upset. I was negative. I was, it was like everything was wrong. The world's wrong. Have you ever had a day like that? The world is wrong. Everybody's wrong. <laughs> you know, your wife's wrong. The dog's wrong. Everybody's wrong. The the, the 49ers are wrong. Everything's wrong. I had to throw that one in. There, so. Everything's wrong. The church is wrong. You get negative. Have you ever gotten negative? And then everything's negative after that. And I was all negative. And later that day, and I can't tell you, I will maybe in the next few weeks what happened, but the, the Lord blessed me with an incredible blessing that afternoon. And that's when you know, I don't deserve this right now. <laughs> this is totally coming to me by the grace of God. This is not because I was good today, because I've been totally wrong today. And I've been judgmental, I've been complaining, I've been critical, I've been all this, and God blesses me. And it just melts you, it melts you, because you see how gracious God is. And he's saying here, look, if God gives you good, if you want to give good gifts to your children, how much more will Father God give you good gifts if you just ask Him? That's showing you the goodness of God. And so He says, therefore, because this is the way God is with you, this is the way God treats you. He gives you good things. You don't deserve them. He's giving them to you. And He's blessing you with them. Then He says, therefore, whatever you want other people to do to you, do that. So simple, so profound, so deep. An amazing statement. You can tell this is, this is the one who has all wisdom and all knowledge that is stating this. And this verse can heal our marriages if we would just follow it. 
He summarizes, isn't that amazing? He summarizes the entire law of prophets in one statement. That is profound. None of us could do that. How many times in our marriage have we had a disagreement with our wife, a disagreement with our husband, and we wanted them to come and apologize to us? I can't believe how many times I have a disagreement with my wife, an argument with my wife, and we walk away, not to know, bless God, she needs to come talk to me. You know, she needs to humble herself. It's her fault. Nothing wrong with me. You know, I'm the one. She needs to come talk to me. She needs to come and ask and apologize to me. She's wrong. I'm the one who is right. She needs to come over here and apologize to me. Just think of what you're saying. Jesus said, whatever you want them to do, that's what you ought to do. My wife, if I'm wanting my wife to apologize to me, that's a statement to me that that's what I need to do with her. <laughs> I mean, that's a revelation right there, isn't it? I wanted her to be nice to me and kind to me and merciful to me. Well, that's what I need to do to her. God, what a revelation. I'm sitting here trying to figure this all out. And the Lord is just giving me this simple thing. If that's what you want Irma to do to you, you need to do that to her. If you want her to be kind, you be kind. I know, I mean, this seems like it's so simple, but it really is profound. And sometimes it's hard to do because we don't want to do it. I don't know if you heard this. Uh, I, I want to also uh, make a statement about what this verse is not saying. You may have heard the story uh, of an eight-year-old girl named Darla. The Sunday school teachers were asking the kids, uh, write a prayer out to God. Just write out a prayer. So this little girl named Darla in Sunday school wrote out a prayer to God. She was mad. She came to Sunday school mad. She was only eight years old. She said, she said Dear God, did you really say to do to others what they have done to you? Because if you did, I'm going to beat the tar out of my little brother Joey. <laughs> Signed, Darla. This verse does not say to do to others what they've done to you. This verse says whatever you want them to do to you, that's what you ought to do. It's so simple and so profound. The truth is, this rule, this law, if you want to call it that, this uh, simple truth eliminates a thousand other rules. You don't need any other rules. You don't need a, somebody to list the 100 rules of marriage. You know, you don't need to have all these rules. You just need to do this rule. And it's so good. And it's so strong. And I love it. So we don't need to even go to this. We don't even need to go to this seminar. <laughs> you don't need to go to this seminar. Just do to them what you want done to you. <laughs> I'm going to save you $20. Well, they're probably not going to... I appreciate that I, I discourage you from going to this, but you don't need to go to any conference. You just need to do the golden rule. So oh, good. Not revenge. Not get even. Not anger. Not unforgiveness. No, we sow peace. We sow love. We sow mercy. We sow kindness. We sow gentleness. We sow truth. We sow righteousness. We do good to others like the Lord has done good to us. How many of us here can say, that God has not been good to us. Dear Lord, God has been good to us. Every day, God is good to us. Every day of my life, God has been good to me. The very fact that I'm even still alive is the mercy of God. God is good to us. How can we treat other people bad when God is treating us so good? It's so amazing. And Luke talks about it too. Luke 6.31, it says, Just as you want men to do to you, do also to them likewise. And if you go back and read the context there of Luke 6, he was talking about loving your enemies, doing good, doing good to those who hate you, and praying for those who despitefully use you. And he says, What credit to you is it if you do good to those who do good to you? That's no credit. Anybody can do that. But it's when you do good to those who are opposed to you or in a negative situation with you. That's when we really find out how much you, you know the Lord. And he concludes this verse by saying, This 
is the law and the prophets. You want to know what the law is trying to teach you and the prophets are trying to teach you. It's their statement right here. Do to others what you want them to do to you. You know that phrase, this is the law and the prophets, is only found one other place in the Bible. It's found in Matthew 22 when Jesus gives us the greatest commandment. To love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. Love your neighbor and your, as yourself. This, these, on these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. So this statement here is a statement of love. This statement is a statement of uh, the golden rule being the great commandment in action. This is true love in practical action. Um, so we should call this not the golden rule, the marriage rule. <laughs> if you don't uh, know, and this is one thing that I like to tell people, I don't know what to do with her. I don't know what to do with him. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this pickle. I'm upset. She won't talk to me right now. If you don't know what to do, and if your wife's not talking to you, and your husband's mad at you, and if you've left the house and you're in conflict and strife, what should you do? You should practice the golden rule. <laughs> That's all you need to do. It's not that difficult. And yet it is difficult because many of us don't want to lay down our life in that way. Whatever you want your husband and your wife to do to you, do that to them. <clears throat> the second area, I, I want to ask you this question. I, I want you to just really think about it for a moment. Who here is a wise an understanding person. You consider yourself wise and understanding. You have the wisdom of God. Who would raise their hand? You're a wise and understanding person. Why? Nobody? <laughs> Is anybody here wise? Is anybody here understanding? Do you have the wisdom of God? Well, James tells you uh, in James chapter 3, that if you do have the wisdom of God, the proof of it is, is you'll show it by your actions. If you, are, if you have wisdom, we're going to see it with good deeds, good works, good actions. We're going to see it. We're going to show other people. Because James said, faith without works is dead. You can say all you want here about faith and how much you believe in Jesus, but we're going to see what you really believe by your actions. You're going to really see what I believe by how I treat other people. And there really is only two kinds of wisdom, just James says. There's the wisdom from below, and there's the wisdom from above. There's earthly wisdom, worldly wisdom, demonic wisdom from here, but there's a wisdom that's coming down from heaven. From the Father of Light. And can I tell you right now, brothers and sisters, if you come and tell me, I'm wise, Pastor Charlie. I read Proverbs every morning. I study the book of James. I know Jesus, who is the wisdom of God. I have this in my life. And you tell me that, and I look at your marriage, and it's full of strife and confusion and darkness, and you're fighting all the time. You are not living in the wisdom of God. We can see by your actions how you much wisdom you're really operating in. And so there's only two kinds of wisdom. You're either in worldly wisdom or you're in the godly wisdom. And there's either a wisdom that's sensual, earthly, and demonic, or there's a wisdom that's coming from above. And in my marriage... I want to have that. I want to not just tell people, hey, everybody, I read one chapter from Proverbs every day. Who cares? The devil knows the Bible better than you do. It's how you're living from that book. It's how you're living from the words that are there. It's what you're taking in and living out day by day. And so if I want to evaluate how I'm doing in my marriage, I don't need to go and take a big test to evaluate myself. I just need to see how peaceful is the relationship between my wife and I. Am I in strife? Are we arguing? Are we fighting all the time? Are we negative? Are we at each other's throat? Is there anger all the time in my house? Then you're living in worldly wisdom. And we need to live in godly wisdom, in the wisdom that's coming from above. 
And so we just go very simply to James chapter 3, verse 17. I'm going to read it here out of the New Living Translation. I love this verse. The wisdom from above is first of all pure. And here it is, man. I, I wish we all had this in our marriage. It's peace-loving. It's gentle at all times. And this is the phrase that I love. It. I, I use this verse, I use these words all the time in marriage counseling. It's willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism. And it's always sincere. The very next verse says, Those who are peacemakers, they plant seeds of peace and they reap of harvest of righteousness. I can tell when a husband and a wife are walking together in the wisdom of God because their marriage is full of peace. There's gentleness there. There's a willingness to yield. They're full of mercy. There's good deeds. There's peacemakers, not troublemakers. We're sowing seeds of peace in our relationship. We're not fighting each other every day. You guys have already heard me say that many, many times. I don't know about you. Uh, some of you guys, we have people here that have been married for 60 years and more. Second four, uh, Lydia and Victor, 60-something. It's a lot of 50 years. Uh, I don't know. I hear, I learned this. Right at the beginning of our marriage, it's deep fighting with your wife. It weighs on you. It's heavy. It's dark. I don't like it. She's wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. But it's no fun fighting and arguing and who's right and you said this and no, you're the one and you need to do this and all that. Man, I don't like that. It drains you emotionally. It just floods your mind with negative thoughts about everything. You're mad at everything and everybody. That is no way to live as Christian believers. And yet I know it happens day by day. It does. And we have to humble ourselves. But I love these words here. We're peace-loving. We're gentle. We're full of mercy. We're peacemakers. And that amazing phrase, we're willing to yield to others. We're willing to say, it's okay. We'll go this way this time. This is not a statement of compromise. It's not that your husband wants to do something ungodly and you say, well, go ahead and do it. You're going to do it anyway. No, that is not what I'm talking about. Your wife wants to do something illegal and you say, oh, yeah, go, well, we'll just go ahead and do it. I don't care. That's not what he's talking about. It's just a willingness day by day. I'm going to yield. If my wife wants to do something, she wants to go somewhere. No, we got to go over here. You know, and then get in a big old fight over whether you're going to go to Denny's or Pollo Loco. Man, get over it. We're going to Pollo Loco, period. <laughs> We're fighting over how the toilet paper is. We're fighting over dumb things. We don't like the way the drapes look. We don't like the way this. You forgot to wash the car. Who cares? You're fighting and arguing over all that stuff. No, it's just, it's okay. Your husband wants to go to the zoo with the kids, and you want to go somewhere else with the kids, and you sit there and fight and argue over where to go. Man, just go to the zoo, you know? Just yield to one another. It's okay. You're not going to lose anything. Just go to the zoo. Why are we fighting? We're dumb. <laughs> D-U-M. We're dumb. That word there, that phrase in Greek, willingness to yield, it means literally you're easy to get along with. I've met some people, maybe my wife is thinking this about me, they're hard to get along with. They're difficult. They make everything difficult. No. You have the Spirit of God. You have the wisdom of God. You are a peaceful person. You're not trying to win arguments every day at the house. 
peacemakers, Jesus said. They're the sons of God. They're the ones that truly are born again, Matthew 5, 9. They're the ones that really know the Lord. So, brothers and sisters, examine yourself. Are you willing to yield to your husband? Are you willing to yield to your wife? Not over moral things, not over compromising things, but just the day-to-day things. It's okay we do this rather than this today. Next week we'll go to... We don't have to have an argument. Who are we going to kiss now? Are we going to Thanksgiving? Are we going to your mom's or my mom? No, we're going to my mom's. I don't care what you say. We're going to my mom. No. We'll go, we'll go here Friday and tomorrow Saturday. We'll go over there. Just be willing to heal. Live in peace with one another. And not fight over every little thing. The third thing is, one of the most difficult areas to deal with in a marriage is when there's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is the great killer of marriage. It hardens people's hearts. In fact, it clogs up your relationship with the Lord. And you guys know this, if you don't forgive, the Lord doesn't forgive you. That's heavy. And it shows that you don't know how much mercy God has shown you. If you have unforgiveness right now, if somebody's hurt you, and I know many of you have been hurt very badly by your wife or your husband, you've been hurt, and you're still holding it against them, and you're still bringing it back up, and you're rehearsing once again the offense that happened a year ago, and three years ago, and five years ago, and ten years ago, and you're bringing up the same old stories again and again, throwing it into their face, there's unforgiveness there. And it's going to kill you. Unforgiveness creates enormous pain and suffering in your life. Let's say it again. Unforgiveness creates enormous pain and suffering in your life. And you guys remember the story in Matthew 18 of the man that owed the Lord 10,000 talents. That was a lot of money. That's millions of dollars. 10,000 talents is millions of dollars. And and, 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 and the master says, come over here, sell him, his kids, and everything, you know, all of his goods, so he can pay back the debt. And that master says, oh, please forgive me, I'll pay back the debt. And it says, in mercy and compassion, the master forgave him the debt. And you guys, brothers, you guys know we can't work enough the rest of our life to pay back what we owe Jesus. We have failed so many times. How many times have you sinned last year? Five or six times last year? I mean, if we sinned a thousand times last year, man, God has been very merciful and granted to us. And you know what happened? That servant, the minute he was forgiven, because that's the way it has to be. God forgives the debt because it's a debt we can't pay. It's too much money. None of us have enough in the bank account, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, in any way do we have enough to pay back what we owe the Lord. So it has to be forgiven by God. It has to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus. It has to be forgiven in the sacrifice of the Lord. The only way God can deal with us is to forgive us of our sins. And when we turn around like that servant did in that story, and as soon as his friend owed him a denarii. I did the math, by the way. And I I, I know how to do proportions. Pastor Rick, math teacher. You know, I I took ten talents and I proportioned it out with a denarii. And so I just made a a ten talents, a million dollars. And I go, I want to see what a denarii is if I make ten talents. A million dollars. You know how much a denarii is if you make ten talents a million dollars? A dollar sixty-nine. That guy went over there and grabbed him by the throat. Pay me what you owe me. With a dollar sixty-nine. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, you got to know this is true. What we did to Jesus is way worse than what they will ever do to us. Wait for it. Next time your husband 
hurt you and your wife offends you. A dollar fifty nine. We make it out to be a billion dollars. The dollar sixty nine. You know, it's shocking that that man threw that guy into prison. And the servants went and talked to the mouth like, you see the guy that you forgave? The one that you showed mercy to? Have you seen what he's doing to another fellow servant? He threw him in jail. The Bible says the master was because of what happened. You know what he did? That servant also got thrown into jail and tortured. Not just jail time, tortured while in jail. And then Jesus makes this shocking statement in Matthew 18, 35, So will my heavenly Father do to you if you don't forgive your brother. Some people are tormented in their lives, wondering why is all this happening to me and all that stuff. Maybe it's because of unforgiveness. Maybe it's because you won't release that person who has hurt you. There's a shocking statement in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. It says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Does it say 50% of the sin? Most of the sin? 97% of the sin? Says love covers all sin. Not the minor one. Love covers all sin. And the Apostle Peter quoted that verse from Proverbs in 1 Peter 4 8, he says, most, This is most important of all. This is the most important of all. It's got to be important if Peter said it was the most important of all. He says, Continue to love deeply one another. And he tells you why. Because the love covers a multitude of sins. A multitude of sins. Ah, that is amazing. A multitude of sins. Agape love empowers us. That it covers a multitude of sins. In fact, the truth is only love can deal with a multitude of sins. Agape love. The New King James says that our love should be fervent on fire. Uh, the word there at Cain is means to reach out. You're reaching out in love to that person who hurts you. Reach out to them. That was an amazing sound. <laughs> what should I say? This most important love. Most important of all, love each other deeply, because love makes you willing. To forgive many sins. Many of us, we need the willingness. We've been so hurt. And man, some of you guys have been really hurt by your husband, by your wife. It's hurtful. It's hurtful even to hear what happened. It pains the heart. And I'm not saying it's an easy thing, but before the Lord, we can get before the Lord and He will give us the strength. He will give us the anointing. He will give us the grace. And He will give us a willingness to forgive the other person. It's a willingness. Am I willing to do this? And I believe this with all my heart, and I preached on it here before. As Christian believers, we are to forgive every sin. Every sin. Now, I want to say, does that mean now that we trust people even when they violated us treacherously? No. It could be that we no longer trust them, but we can forgive everything. We 
gift with the other. I can't bear it. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other. Forgive each other. If you have a grievance against anyone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Just remember how much the Lord forgave you. And from that verse, I, different translations have it. I call it the triple A of forgiveness. The triple A of forgiveness. And we've thought, thought about it many times. Anything against anyone. That's the foundation of forgiveness. I wonder if we can say that together. Anything against anyone. I think that's pretty comprehensive. Anything against anyone. Wow. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. He said if there's any grievance, any complaint against someone else, and Lord have mercy, it should be that way with your husband and your wife. Anything against anyone. Unforgiveness will create great resentment in your heart against that person and others. It's agape love that conquers everything. Let's read now in Proverbs, the fourth thing, chapter 18. And I've taught a lot from this verse, too, about relationships. <clears throat> to me, this is one of the most amazing statements. And we need to take heed to this. This is a warning. Proverbs 18, verses 18 through 22. <clears throat> Certainly one of the most important verses in the Bible on relationships. And I just want to tell you right now, offenses, offending your, your wife or your husband is deadly. That will also kill your marriage. If you look at verse 18, it uses the word contention, fight. Verse 19 uses the word contention, argument, fight. Verse 20 and 21 say that almost, well, I'm going to say it this way, almost all of our arguments and fights come because of one thing, that little thing that's in your mouth. I hear you can control anything. You can control your little dog. You can control your fish. You can control your hand. You can control your feet. But none of us can control what's in our mouth. We need the Holy Spirit. Contention, verse 20, talks about what's coming out of your mouth, your lips, uh, your mouth. Death and life, verse 21, and the power of the tongue. And it leads right into verse 22, marriage. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. I think, men, we need to really focus on verse 22. Your wife is a good thing from the Lord. Your wife Come with favor from God. Yeah, that is awesome. That Hebrew word there for favor means to delight in, to joy, to be filled with joy. Isn't that awesome? That package, that beautiful package that God gave you, this precious gift of your wife, come with joy all over it. Wow. You say, Pastor Charlie, you don't live with the woman I live with. I don't. I, thank God I don't. But man, man, wow, we should never, ever look down on our wife. Our wife is a good thing from God. And we obtain favor from Him. It's a joy to have a good wife from the Lord. Man, that is a blessing from the Lord. We delight in it. We enjoy it. It's a beautiful thing. Our wife is not a bad thing. She is a good thing from God. Well, here he tells us, man, the one thing I want, the one thing we all want in our marriages, in our homes, is we want contentions to cease. We don't want the strife and fighting and arguments and conflict to be there. 
We don't want them to continue. And it talks about it keeps the mighty apart. You get two strong-willed people, two mighty people, you got to keep them apart. They're going to fight. They won't humble themselves. But he makes a statement here in verse 19 that's so uh, important, brothers and sisters. When you offend somebody, when you're having arguments and you're yelling at each other and you're angry with one another, it's creating offenses. And in your heart, it's like bars of a castle. And it becomes easier to overrun a strong city than to win back your husband and your wife after they have been offended. And I hear men and women call themselves, they call, they call each other names and they're, they're mad and they, they're saying really derogatory things to one another. That should never be for Christian believers that we call people those things. We are erecting bars in our heart that are going to be so hard to overcome. And we wonder why our wife stays mad at us or our husband. Well, maybe we have offended them. And the cause of these offenses is that little thing in our mouth. And here in verse 20 and 21, if you read these two verses, you see the word fruit. You see the word produce. You see the word fruit mentioned here three times. Fruit, produce, fruit. How many of you know, brothers and sisters, your words are going to produce? And it's either going to be bitter fruit or it's going to be sweet fruit. And your words are either going to bring life or death. And it says, whatever you do with your words, you're going to eat it. You're, like they say, you're going to eat your words. It says it there at the end of verse 21. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Whatever's coming out of your mouth, that's what you're going to eat. And it's going to go down all the way into your stomach, verse 20. And you guys all, we all know, you guys have been married for more than 24 hours. You guys already know this. We sometimes say stuff, and man, we wish we could get back those words we just finished saying. We're going to say things that are going to misunderstand. We're going to say things that are going to be hurtful in our marriage. We're going to say things uh, that we wish we had never said. We're going to regret it. It's going to happen, and we're just going to have to humble ourselves and admit where we've been wrong. But brothers and sisters, I say speak words of life over your wife. Speak words of love over your husband. Do not curse them. Do not put them down. Do not complain to others about them. Speak words of life because death and life are in the power and the control of the tongue. We need to bless each other in our marriage, with our words. But don't offend. Oh, I've heard so many bitter, angry words exchanged in my presence. And you know, <clears throat> I say this, and uh, again, this is not with anybody I'm counseling now, but I, said, I have said this in the past. If people are cursing their wife or husband in my presence as a pastor, I wonder what they're doing behind closed doors. If you are, are you that bold to say that to another person, in front of another person, in front of your own pastor, you're out of control. You're out of control. That's not right. It's not good. That you're speaking these kinds of words. I've heard some, more, some of the most painful things spoken in counseling sessions where people are putting the other one down and it's wrong and it's a fight and they sit on the other side and they're arguing one another and calling each other derogatory things. That should never be. If I can remember one time I, I asked a brother, he was telling me how bad his wife was right there with his wife telling, right there listening to the whole thing. And I said, man, you're dumb. Why did you even marry her? <laughs> Your wife is not that bad. You need to repent. You've got to humble yourself. You can't talk to your wife like that or about your wife like that. You can't handle that. That's, that's offensive. You're offending her right in my presence. I'm offended by what you're saying. We should never offend because it's hard to win back people who have been offended. 
It's hard to win back people who you've been yelling at and arguing with and fighting over. It's like the bars of a castle. You can't get through to their heart again because of all the offenses that have been made. The last thing, go with me to 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 11. I'm going to stop right here. I want to ask you, who here has married a virtuous woman? Who's, who's married a virtuous wife? Man, all of you guys should raise your hand because your wife is going to be looking at you in this little <laughs> the service is over. I'm raising my hand right here, right now. I, I want to sleep on the bed tonight. Amen. <laughs> Who here is married is married to a woman who fears the Lord? Man, that is precious. You married a wife who fears the Lord. That's the most precious of all. You know what the Bible says about a virtuous woman and about a woman who fears the Lord? Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he with her. I love those words. Proverbs goes on to say in Proverbs 31, 30, Charm is deceitful. Beauty is fading or passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Praise her. Praise her. She shall be praised. <clears throat> so praise your wife. Even when the kids wake up, they say she's blessed. Even when the, your wife wakes up, you're praising her. Now, you should. You should tell her how beautiful she is, how wonderful she is, how much you love her, speak words of endearment and love. The minute you wake up, that should be on your lips, man. We praise our wives. He praises her. I love that. <clears throat> Here in 1 Corinthians 11 is one of the most important instruction on marriage in the whole Bible. And I'm looking here particularly at verses 3 down all the way. Mm, we could go down to verse uh, 12 or into 13. In this section of Scripture, Paul uses the word head, head, 11 times. Head. And that statement is a statement of authority. If you go type in a concordance or you look up in a concordance the word head and you find out everywhere it appears, it's going to show up in the writings of Paul. And Paul will speak about the headship of Jesus. He's the head of the body. He's the head of the church. He's the head over all principality and power. And here it says he's the head over the man. He's the authority. And we, we declare it again, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of the marriage. The man is not the Lord over the marriage. Jesus is Lord over the marriage. And so this is, this is what he's talking about. The head. Who's the head? And the man can come around to you and say, you know what, I'm the head of this house. And that's how we speak about a head coach or a head of state. It's, it's who, who's got the head? Who, who's in charge? Who has authority? Who's going to say at the end of the day, this is the way we're going to go? It's Jesus who's Lord. And if He's the one who's Lord over a marriage, then He's the head over the man. It doesn't say He will be. It says that's who He is. Every, the head of every man, verse 3, is Christ. It's not going to be. It not might be. It is this way. That Jesus is the head. And Jesus is the head of every man. And you might want to note the word authority that's found in verse 10. It talks about a woman having a symbol of authority on her head. It's dealing with an issue of authority. 
some men say, some commentators come in here and they say, oh, this is not, doesn't say husband and wife, it says woman and man. Well, the one where it says they're the head of the woman is man, that's not talking about, I'm not the head of some other lady here in the church. My wife is who I've been made head of. Paul wrote about that in Ephesians 5, that the man is the head over the wife. And also over here in verse 7, it says the woman is the glory of the man. Not any woman here is, is the gl- my glory. My glory is my wife. So it's talking about husbands and wives here. And I want to give this word of security to you wives. When, when you hear uh, any type of teaching like he is the head and you have to submit to the head, just keep this in mind. Jesus is the head over your husband. Man, that ought to make you rest. Woo! You can just look at your husband and say, man, if you mess with me, I know Jesus. <laughs> and he's over you. <laughs> oh, I love that. A woman should be at peace if her husband is a Christian and he's walking in the ways of the Lord. He has Jesus as his head. And the whole teaching that's brought out here, and it's mentioned twice in verses uh, Four and verse five is you don't want to dishonor any head. Christ does not dishonor God. A man should not dishonor Christ, and a woman should not dishonor her husband or disrespect him. Ephesians five thirty three says, "Husbands love your wives as your own body, and wives see that they respect their husbands." One of the worst things a woman can do is to disrespect her husband. That is the worst thing. You can do everything else. You can shoot him with a gun in the foot, and he won't care. But if you disrespect him, that hurts him at the worst part of who he is. I was at a party one time, and a Christian wife was yelling at her Christian husband and, and speaking down to him where everybody could hear it at the party. And it was so disrespectful. And it was like, every time she said something, it was like, ooh, like, it was like, like, she was even she was talking to her husband and was hitting me right here in the gut. It's like, wow. That's the worst thing. And you could see him, you could see he was just, he was just twisting and turning as she was everybody she was staining him in front of everybody. Yeah, that's the worst thing you can do. So we never want to dishonor our head. The wife should never dishonor her husband. The man should not dishonor Christ, and Christ has never dishonored his Father. But I want to tell you, there's just one head, brothers and sisters. There's just one head inside the house, and that's Jesus Christ as Lord. And when we as men, if we want to have Jesus as Lord in our house, that means every day when we get up, we are on our knees and getting direction from the head so that we can lead our family and talk to our wives and say, I have been with the Lord and He is speaking to me in this way to lead the family. Give me your feedback. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me where we should be going to. I want to confirm what the Lord is saying to me. But we are on our knees because Jesus is Lord of this house. And when we do that, we establish our headship over the wife. It is beautiful what the Lord has done. We never want to dishonor our head. <clears throat> but I love this for all of us men. I'm going to close out this marriage series. Men, may we never forget this. This is one of the most vital truths for Christians in a Christian home is the last words of verse 7. I pray that all of us, we will, we will write it on our mirror when we're shaving in the morning. We will think about it. Wives, go ahead and write this out and hand it to him on a piece of paper. I love this. I love, I love these words. The woman is the glory of the man. The woman, the wife, is the glory of her husband. You know what? Me by myself, I'm not very much. But when Irma you find out Irma's my wife, it makes me look a lot better. <laughs> People like Irma, you know. Irma's humble, Irma's meek, Irma loves the Lord. And when I'm there by myself, man, they could take me or leave me, you know. But when Irma shows up, it's like, oh, Brother Charlie, let me give you a high five right there, man. 
I just watched that. It was kind of sad because it was during the time of his assassination. But when John Kennedy spoke in Fort Worth, Texas, just maybe an hour before he was assassinated, he was speaking in Fort Worth, Texas. If you ever watched that, he was real funny. He was telling jokes and all that. And he literally had a call. Clint Hill, that special agent that was in the back of the car when he was assassinated, he called him. Hey, where's, where's Jackie? She needs to get out here. When he walked out... Two thousand people, three thousand people were there, and then she showed up in that pink outfit. They all stood on their feet. Oh, the woman, the glory of the man, the wise make us look good. You got to know that your wife makes you look good. Man, I say I married up. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I married up. Dude. I'm sorry that Irma had to reach out so far to get, get me, but I married up. I mean, like I had a home run. I, I just, I was, I was running around the bases, man. I, I did it. I got Irma. <laughs> Husband, your wife is your glory. They make you look good. Isn't it amazing in Revelation? It says, the wife of the Lamb. Oh, the glory of God. Oh, of the glory of God. And that's what it says in Ephesians 5 when Paul was talking about the marriage relationship. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. You know what? A glorious church, when you and I are doing what God called us to do, and we're glorious, and we're walking in the fear of God, and the power of God, and we're honoring Him, and we're serving Him, it makes Christ look good. Because it's His bride. We have the glory of God. God gives us, John 17, He gives us His glory so we can be one and be united like He is one. We need the glory of God in our midst. We don't share His glory. Nobody shares His glory. But we have the glory of God because it allows us to then witness. When they see us, they're going to say, man, I want to serve Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. Because look, look at how this guy is, is, is acting now and living now. But when you never forget that. Men, never put down your glory. <laughs> don't put down your wife. She's your glory. Irma is my glory. Irma makes me look good. And I, I, I do. I feel when I go to some meeting and I go by myself, here we go again. I'll sit in the back. But when Irma's there, <laughs> where, where can I sit here? I'm with my wife, you know. Irma makes me look good. She's my glory. The wives never forget. Don't dishonor your husband. Be respectful. And men never forget your wife's your glory. Never put her down. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your grace and mercy. I do pray for the marriages. And this year, Father, we want to promote healthy marriages. We want to model healthy marriages. We want to model teaching that says this is the way. Walk ye in it. Bless our people today. Bless the marriages. I know right now, Father, even as I was speaking, it got quiet when I talked about forgiveness. Because I know that many people are hurting from being offended and and deeply offended by hurtful actions of husbands and wives. And I pray, Father, you give them a willingness to forgive, and you give them a willingness to reconcile, and that you would heal our marriages, Father God. Right now, any words that have been spoken, that have been death, I just come against those words in Jesus' name, and I say, no, we will stand. We will trust God to heal you and restore you and make you whole. I pray for my marriage, Lord, that I will be strong in the Lord and my wife will be strong in the Lord in my, and in your mighty power. Heal us, Lord God. Make us strong. May we not have a negative attitude about marriage. May we see marriage as a godly thing, that it is of God and we want to walk in it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you.